Today we're going to talk about isolated queen pawn positions, your favorite topic. Okay, and uh, isolated queen pawn means your queen pawn is isolated. Class to no. Um, now most people don't like isolated pawns because they're dogmatic and they blunder a lot. But uh, I'm going to show you positions where it's good to have the isolated pawn and positions where it's not so good. Uh, the first few games are mine, and the last game is my favorite, a game between two players you've never heard of, Karpov and Kasparov. Okay, I'm not kidding. Okay, so the first game was played by me, and this was a Nimzo Indian. And normally in isolated queen pawn openings, openings? Normally in positions that have isolated queen pawns, normally it's a queen pawn opening. If white plays e4 on move one, it's less likely, but still possible. Okay, and I've had this kind of position quite often. And black plays d5. If black doesn't play d5 ever, then the game wouldn't be in my lecture because there wouldn't be an isolated queen pawn. Okay, so d5, and eventually I was able to take this pawn, and my opponent realized if he took with a knight, that this pawn would be hanging on g7. So after trading queens, he took with a pawn, and we start our lecture. So this is an isolated pawn, and isolated means no pawn can protect it. There's no pawn on adjacent files. So normally when you're looking at an isolated pawn, you might be thinking, I can win that pawn. I'll attack it, and they can't defend it. And that's possible. The other way to play against an isolated pawn is to play around it and block it so it can't move. And in this particular position, I have a dark squared bishop, which is in front of the pawn. It's actually more likely that we're going to put a knight in front of a pawn. When your opponent has an isolated pawn, you generally want a knight in front of it because the knight can't be attacked. Bishops can usually be traded by other bishops. In this situation, that's not possible because he doesn't have a dark squared bishop. Only I do. So my bishop in front of the pawn is quite good. I'm not interested in winning the pawn. I'm interested in it never moving and attacking me. So I develop my pieces, like I'm supposed to, and he decides to sacrifice a pawn. And the reason is he thinks he's going to win my pawn on g2, because he has sort of a skewer going. <coughs> bishop e5, and he plays king e7. He's sort of giving up. Why didn't he play knight takes bishop? It's a brilliant tactical point. This isn't beginner class anymore? No? No, it's illegal. You can't do it as pinned. Now, he realized, in fact, we're going to see another game where I do the same thing. He realized if he takes my pawn, what will I do? I'll give you a hint. It's why I played bishop e5. You. Bishop to g3. And his rook isn't so healthy. I might play king f1 and take it. Also, his rook can't move anywhere, so it's not healthy anyway. And he changed his mind and decided his rook would get trapped, and he just unpinned his knight with king e7. Now he is threatening knight takes my bishop, so bishop g3, and I'm a pawn up, and well, now he has a lot of isolated pawns. Okay, that's... Uh, three isolated pawns. I have no isolated pawns. My pawns are all together. So by blocking his pawn, he got desperate, tried to get counterplay by getting his knight to e4. And we're going to see other games <clears throat> this lecture where using that d5 pawn, or if white has an isolated pawn, d4, it's actually great for putting a knight on e4. That's actually one of the benefits of having an isolated pawn. It controls the the center, and white doesn't have any pawns controlling black side of the center. This pawn here controls two white squares in the center, and white can't say that he's doing that. So black took advantage of that, but unfortunately he lost a pawn doing it, and the rest was a bit silly. And now I attack the pawn. Hooray! And he doesn't want me to take it, because that forks his king and the rook. How did black defend his d5 pawn? I think there's only one way to do it. I think. Yeah, I think there's only one way to do it. Yep, so it's isolated. I blocked it, and now I'm attacking it. 
knight f6. I think he played knight f6, right. And I want to take his pawn, but he defended it. That's not fair. So how do you remove the defender, the knight on f6? Then I could take his pawn in the corner. Bishop h4? I think I did that. Yeah. Okay, now he made a move you will not consider. Anyone at home? Come on, you can do it. Yes? Incorrect, because you considered it. So it's, it's wrong automatically. Yeah. No, he made the best move. Seriously. Yeah, there were normal moves. He resigned. Yeah, because he's down a pawn, his knight's pinned, I'm threatening knight takes pawn. After bishop e6, I have several ways to win. Rook c7 check, knight h5, or not moving, also winning, because this pin is really hard to break. Um, yeah, so that was a terrible game from his point of view, and his pawn was weak the whole game, and putting the knight back on f6, that really showed that knight e4 was misguided. Um, too aggressive, too quick. Instead of giving up his, his pawn on g7, he should have defended it or not played for knight e4. But here he already has a bad position. The advantage of this pawn is you get to play knight e4 and your knight's protected, but unfortunately he lost other material and then his pawn was weak because his knight wasn't defending it. Eventually he went back. So terrible game for my opponent. You might think, boy, what a bad player, but he was over 2300. Was. Okay, next game was against international master, uh, Leonid Bassin, and this actually came out of a transposition of a French defense, and I played d4. That's not easy to do. Usually the French defense starts e4. You agree. He played e6, so I played e4. Okay, and I like to play the exchange variation because I figure this is a symmetrical position, and it's my move. Sounds good. Okay, and usually we don't see isolated queen pawns here unless I have them. I'll take either side. And I played c4. Now, in fact, in the World Open in 2002, as you all know, in Philadelphia, I played this position and I offered my opponent a draw. He accepted and I got a grandmaster norm. Hooray. And that was against Arthur Yusupov, who was a candidate for the world championship about 20 years ago, although not now. <clears throat> and when Alfred Dry put his head down for 15 minutes, and then he woke up and said, okay. okay. <laughs> Couldn't believe he'd draw a player of my caliber, but... Okay, now, this is actually quite humorous. Uh, not the bone, the, the, the joke. Uh, man, nobody got that. Okay, so... Yeah, I know. You claim you got it, but you didn't. Okay, so a friend of mine... A friend? Yeah. He said, Ben, whenever my opponent plays the French, I lose everything. So I played the French against him every game, and I cr No, that's not what happened. So I said, what do you mean? He says, well, my pawns get in the center, and my opponent takes them. Every time. I said, OK, I'll take care of it. Play the exchange variation. You've already saved one pawn. Can't lose the pawn you traded. Okay? And then play this variation. Your opponent won't know it. Now, a lot of people, when they play the French with black, and white plays bishop to d3, they were taught to trade off these bishops by playing knight e7 and bishop f5, which is usually a good idea. Not a good idea in this variation, c4. And I've had many people in blitz chess play knight e7. Okay? And I told the guy, if they play knight e7, you have a really good move here. Who can find it? Really good move for white, highly recommended. Anybody but him. Okay, there was a USCF election once for, you know, policy board. And for one position, there was one guy running. And they were reading the votes out. So they said his name a lot. And then one of the votes was anybody but him. Okay, I know who cast that vote too. It wasn't me, but it should have been. So anybody but you. You. C5. C5. And my friend is rated about 1950. And I said, oh, then you win a piece. The bishop's trapped. And his answer was... Nobody will ever do that. You're crazy and so forth. Okay? Maybe that was another time we were talking. Now, and the first game after our talk next week, he got this position, his opponent resigned. So I think I was right. Okay? 
then he started playing this against the French because he won a game in five moves and without thinking. Okay, now my opponent's international master, so for some reason he didn't play 97 losing a piece. It's unfortunate. Okay, he took on c4, and I took, and actually this could be from a queen's gambit accepted. Notice I have an isolated pawn. Who would have thunk it? But that's the lecture, so. Okay, and I played h3 because I thought bishop g4 would be annoying. So h3, and he played h6 because he thought bishop g5 would be annoying. And I played bishop to e3 because I developed my pieces. Bishop to h5, f5 I should say, and knight h4. Now, knight h4 attacks his bishop. I crossed my fingers, but he saw it. But I didn't play knight h4 to win his bishop because that wouldn't be fair. I actually want to play knight f5, but I got to get my knight to f5. So I'm going to put my queen on f3 and then play knight f5. Occasionally, if his bishop goes back, I can sometimes play knight to g6 and he's pinned. Now, this pawn's isolated, that's the lecture, but it controls the e5 square and the c5 square, so it's not so bad. Bishop back, queen f3. So I have a very active position, and he can't harass my queen with knight to e5 because of my isolated pawn. And I have more pawns in the center than my opponent. Well, it's isolated, but I defended it. And unlike the previous game, where I played against the isolated pawn, I'm actually controlling the square in front of my pawn. I got three guys here that are controlling the square in front. He can't block my pawn. I got that under control. He can't win my pawn. I got that under control. And now I can go to f5 with my knight. He played knight to d5. Oh, that's right. Okay, and now he's unleashing an attack on, on the knight on h4. A very suspicious move. Okay, notice how he's attacking my knight. So he wants to block my isolated pawn so much, he moves to a square attack three times. That's why he's an IM and I'm, and I'm not. Wait a minute. Okay, so I played knight f5 because I wanted to. And we traded, and now I have the two bishops. And if he eliminates my two bishops, my pawn will no longer be isolated, and I'll have a big attack on the f file. If he plays knight takes e3, f takes e3, then I have a big attack, and I have two pawns in the center to zero. My bishop on e3, not so good. I can't really move anywhere, so yeah, take my bishop, get rid of it. He attacked my queen, but I saw it. Attacked my queen again, I saw it again. And now he made the losing move, which is good because I was playing him. Okay, if he was my student, then not so good. Knight to g6. The same blunder my last opponent made. Maybe you should learn this because my opponents do it every game. He thought, like my last opponent, if I take the b-pawn, he'll take my b-pawn, just like the last guy. And then you suggested, right, you suggested bishop to g3, but now you suggest bishop to b3. The rooks get trapped on both sides of the board. That rook's not very good because I'm going to take it. Okay, so this position well, is actually already bad for black because my d pawn is defended. He'll never win it. It defends the center squares, and I'm controlling the square in front of it, and I have two bishops. So already it's better for white. Also, I have sort of a mild threat, maybe more than mild. I'm threatening bishop takes h6, and the pawn is defending everything. Can't do both. So I'm threatening h6, I'm threatening b7. He's already in trouble. Why? I have active pieces. My pieces are more active than his, and mainly it's because of my isolated pawn, the d-pawn that's controlling squares in the center. I get to go to those squares. My pawn's controlling c5. He's not controlling c4. I'm controlling e5 and e4 and d5. I dominate the center, and I have two bishops. So he already has a lost position. Attacked my queen, but I played queen b7. What's the threat? Yes. Bishop takes f7. Bishop takes f7, and then I take his rook with my queen. If he somehow stops that, maybe I'll take his a7 pawn. Who knows? 
queen b8, we traded, and I attacked his rook. Good luck saving your rook. Well, that's not your rook, so what I'm yelling at you for. And he got all he could for his rook. But look at my isolated pawn defending my knight. Yes. Okay, look at his isolated pawns. I'm going to take them. Okay, that's better. Yummy. Okay, my isolated pawn can never be captured, and it actually protects some important squares. And okay, then I had technique because I was younger, so I actually played okay then. King g6, what kind of move is that? And he resigned here because we're going to trade rooks, and then I'm going to take that pawn, and then I'm going to have an isolated queen. Okay, isolated d pawn becomes a queen, and his knight on h4 smells like ammonia to me. There's an ammonium, I never know. <laughs> you know, nh4. Can you guys write in from there and tell me which it is? Okay, so yeah, terrible play from black, but here the isolated pawn worked out really well because I had it. And I got to tell you, most people I know don't want to have isolated d-pawn. They hate it. Okay, I'll play either side, and there's advantages and disadvantages. Your d-pawn can control a lot of squares, and sometimes your knight gets to go to e5 because your pawn is defending it. And it can be bad because your opponent blocks it and takes it. So if you know what's good and what's bad about it, then you can take advantage of these things. Okay, this is one of my favorite games. It's against Al Chow, who's a senior master. Well, he was in Chicago. And we played a very unusual opening. He played a very early c5. And when you see all these pawns in the center like this, Somebody's going to have an isolated pawn, very likely. Turned out it was him. Takes, takes. Total confusion. Okay, and I threw in a check if I remember correctly. Yeah. And he doesn't really have a good way to block because when he blocks, he's going to block his queen from access to the d pawn. So he's going to have an isolated pawn. Here, my knight's hanging, so I took. And as you can see, pretty quickly, he has an isolated pawn. I already have it blocked. It's already blocked. Okay. Now, I tried to figure out where my pieces should go. I played bishop d2. I wanted to play bishop c3 and be on this diagonal and cement my knight on d4 so it's blocking his pawn. And I played knight to b3, so my queen would have access towards his king. And he made a terrible move here, bishop to d7. The bishop is very bad on d7 because it blocks his queen, it blocks his defense of the pawn, and it forces my queen to a better square. This is the typical move of a low-rated player, not of a strong player like Chow, not having a good day. Uh, my queen's not very good on a4. I'd like to move it over to the king's side. And his bishop is actually worse on d7 than on c8. It just blocks his queen. And he defended. And you can see black has an isolated pawn, but he has all the negative aspects of the pawn. He can't play knight e4 because it's defended. I have his pawn blocked by four different pieces. So if he ever plays d4, I have a wide choice of how to take his pawn. So his pawn can't move, and he's not using the squares that the pawn is defending for attack. On the other hand, I have an attack. And here he blundered by playing bishop b5 because he thought this was a good bishop. That's a bad bishop. Let's trade them. Normally that would be correct, but it's incorrect here because black gives up a very important square which I used to squish him. When black trades the bishops with bishop to b5, which square is he giving away to me? Only Alex Marler knows. See? Yeah. So black just played bishop b5 question mark, totally ceding a very important square to me. Yes? F5. F5. Okay. I want to put pieces on f5 and crush him. Now for those of you who showed up late, show up earlier next time. Okay. This is a lecture on isolated queen pawn positions. Okay, so my opponent thought he was trading bishops, but instead he was getting mated. So he was sort of right. So we traded, I attacked his queen, he saw it, and I played knight f5. Now, 
When your opponent plays knight f5, it's good to get rid of it. Bishop takes knight, knight takes knight, pawn takes knight. But yeah, he can't get rid of it. So resigning was best because he didn't resign, and then you're going to see what happened to him. It wasn't pretty. Now, if it was white's move here, white has several moves that win. Uh, I think F actually immediately. Queen g5 wins. Knight takes g7 wins. And positionally, knight takes bishop, and bishop takes knight wins, because he'll have 37 isolated pawns and doubled. Okay? Although I wouldn't do that, I would mate him. Okay? So he played a pretty poor move. I mean, it, it's probably the best move, but it looks terrible. 98, defending. Now I can't mess up his pawn structure. But again, this is all the negatives of the isolated pawn. The pawn controls these squares, but that's useless. Sometimes the pawn can advance and crush you. It can never advance. So it's just weak, and I have a big attack. If the pawn wasn't isolated, and it was on e6, my knight could never go to f5. So having an isolated pawn is double-edged. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. And I don't, I don't particularly prefer one side or the other. I just try to get advantage of what the position offers me. And I play queen g4, threatening everything. Every move wins. But the main threat is knight to h6 check. And then I take his queen with advantage. And he'll stop that, because he's a good player. And then I have a lot of guys attacking his g7 pawn. Okay, So really strong players, like Alex Marler, when they see this position, they go, man, this isn't good for black. They're like, ah. Oh. And the better you get at chess, the more you hate black's position. So if you think black is better, you're one of the low-rated players. If you think black is completely losing, then you're better than Carlson. Much better, okay, somehow. <laughs> My opponent played queen e6 because he's tricky. Now, most people would just take on g7 without thinking, right, Julian? No. <laughs> See, he didn't read his lines beforehand. <laughs> But I was like, wait a minute, why is he letting me take on g7? What's going on here? Well, knight takes g7, hangs my queen. He plays queen takes queen. Queen takes g7, hangs my queen to his knight. So the obvious move is bishop takes g7. Now if he plays knight takes bishop, I play queen takes knight mate. Otherwise, I start taking everything. But when I played bishop g7, I saw the best move for him, and I was ready for it. And when I show my students this move, they usually think for a while and blunder all their pieces and they lose. So not good. So what did black play in this position? What's the best defense, Alex? H5. H5. A sneaky move. Attacking my queen, that's not nice. And I saw H5 and I saw the winning way to play for white, although most of my students don't and they give all their pieces away and black wins. So that's not good. H5 is a very aggressive move. It attacks the queen, and it tries to draw the queen away from the bishop. The queen is defending the bishop, so if the queen takes the pawn, then it's not defending the bishop, so black can just take it. If the queen moves somewhere else, maybe the knight's hanging. So the queen's actually doing a lot. It's defending the knight, defending the bishop. But I saw H5. I was ready for that. Who can find the winning move for white? Somehow my opponents start with one isolated pawn. They always have three. Hmm. Let's remember that. Because in my lecture yesterday, there were five isolated pawns. Tr true story. They're doubled. So. White to play and win. The crowd is deathly ill. Uh, silent, silent. <coughs> they won't sue me for that, right? Yes. Queen takes h5, he would play knight takes g7. Are we continuing the analysis? Are we starting over? What? Are we starting over? Oh, yeah, knight takes e7. Knight takes e7 is what I played. Check. And if he doesn't take my knight and plays king h7, which I don't understand, I would take his queen and then take his rook. So he took my knight. And now what did I do? All my pieces are attacked. No! Bishop, 
Bishop f6 does win, but I played the simpler bishop takes rook check. If he takes my queen, I take his queen, and I have an extra rook. Although he straightened his pawns out a little. Still has an isolated d pawn. Whew. So he took, took, and played on several more moves instead of resigning, much to Alex's chagrin. But okay, that wasn't so interesting. Okay, and he resigned here. Now I have an isolated d pawn, so he resigned. He's like, okay. I got nothing now. So in that game, isolated d-pawn looked terrible. He got nothing. Now, the most famous isolated queen-pawn game, which everybody knows, right, Alex, is the Karpo aforementioned Karpov-Kasparov game. This is the famous Karpov-Kasparov white square symphony game. Okay, And I like this game for a couple reasons. I always like when Karpov beats Kasparov. You got to like that. But more importantly, Kasparov has an isolated queen pawn, then he doesn't, then he does again. Very suspicious. Okay? And Kasparov played Queen's Gambit declined. And Queen C2 is a move, Queen D2 is a move, Rook C1 is a move, Queen B3 is a move. Uh, Rook C1 is the most common, but Queen C2 is the old Capablanca move. So it's got to be good. Knight a6, very suspicious, and c5. And remember what I told you earlier in the lecture, when you see all these pawns here, somebody's gonna have an isolated queen pawn, somebody. Turned out it was black. And there's the isolated pawn. So white could have tried to win a pawn earlier, but white's king is on e1, he doesn't want the position open, he doesn't want the d-file open. He wants it closed up. And he wants to work on this pawn, oh, for the next 63 moves or so, approximately. And well, this is sort of the starting position. And as you can see, Karpov's already, already doing pretty well, because he has a lot of guys blocking the d-pawn. And when the d-pawn is blocked and it can't move, then we can win it later, much later. And Kasparov wants to use the e4 square, but Karpov's defending that as well. So Karpov was ready for this. Bishop e2. Doesn't want to play bishop d3 and give the bishop away or block his queen and rook. Queen b6. Now, if black plays knight to e4, that's very risky because it loses immediately. Therefore risky. Because I take, threatening your queen, and if you take... What does white do? Yes? Knight takes. Knight takes. And then white's a piece up with good technique. Okay. So Kasparov doesn't want to play knight e4 eventually. So queen b6. Now maybe I can play knight e4. Castles. Knight e4. I didn't even know he played that. But. Okay. So did Karpov take that knight on e4? Anyone? You can guess. No, then I'm going to call this the isolated e-pawn lecture. It's not even isolated. No, that rook on d8, it doesn't want a pawn in front of it. It wants to attack. That isolated pawn is blocking it. Queen c2. Isolated pawn there forever. Takes, takes. So by trading the knights, it's hard for Kasparov to put a knight on e4 or c4 and use his d-pawn effectively. However, Kasparov says, trade, 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 it's a draw. How can the guy beat me? There's no pieces left. And the one piece that he has that's great, I got it pinned and attacked. So I can draw this. Bishop e6. Kasparov's just going to chill out and say, you can't beat me. I'm too solid. I got two bishops. But he's playing Karpov. That was his only mistake. Queen c2, unpinning his knight, controlling f5. Karpov must have seen my game that hadn't happened yet with Chow. Rook c8, queen b1. He doesn't want the queen on d2. He wants the rooks to be on the d-file, and he wants his queen to defend not only the b2 pawn, but control f5. I like playing queen b1 and queen pawn openings. Then they can't attack my queen. Rook c7, Kasparov wants to double on the c-file. And now knight takes e6. That's why this game is the white square symphony. Now we're going to see white taking over the white squares. 
Now, when you play knight takes e6, an isolated queen pawn, are you worried black is going to take with a queen or the pawn? Which do you worry about if you're white in this position? Which move scares you a little? Taking with a pawn because the pawn's not isolated anymore. Takes with a queen, you're like, okay, great. Isolated pawn, not defended by the bishop anymore. Now I'm going to go win it. Rick d1, bishop f3. But Karpov's like, wait a minute. If he takes with a pawn, then I can play queen g6, bishop d3, and I can attack the king because there's no white square defense of the king. If he takes with a queen, I'm going to go win this guy. Rook here, bishop here, and there's no bishop to defend it. Well, Kasparov is an active player, so he plays the active move. He got rid of his isolated d-pawn, but he'll, he'll get it back. He doesn't want it back. But. And now, black's king is exposed because he's not defending the white squares. Bishop g4, attack, putting pressure on the pawn. h3, getting luft. And Karpov just moves around, beautiful. Doesn't really do very much, but make sure the pawns can't move. And bishop to g6. And white actually has a very interesting plan here. He wants to give black an isolated pawn again while he's threatening mate on the king side. And e4 is the, the key move of the game. So obviously, Karpov wants to play queen g6, but Kar Kasparov's like, no, 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 you're not going to do that. And if white trades queens, it's very unlikely he'll win. Opposite color bishops, even material. So now he wants to give an isolated pawn again. And if black plays d4, white can play e5, and then queen e4, and the d-pawn is hanging. Terrible. So once again, he gets an isolated pawn. And we're back to square one. And unfortunately for black, this king's very safe. That king's very suspicious. Now most people, like let's say Alex Marler, for example, he's like, rawr, queen h7 mate, or some, you know, I have to win now. Karpov, incredibly patient, moves his pieces around and around until you're dizzy, and then mates you later. And when you get better at chess, like Alex, then you start to get more patient. And Karpov's building up in this position is really ingenious. Bishop b1, doesn't want the queen attacking the bishop. Now, white has more squares for his queen to attack h7, and the bishop isn't getting hit anymore. Queen d2, who thinks white should trade queens? I raised my hand and nobody else did. Okay, good. Queen e5, rook d8, queen f5, and Kasparov says, hmm, getting mated is bad, so king g8. Always repeat. How many moves in a row did white move on the white Every move. Every yeah. Okay, always repeat, as Alex Marler knows. Bishop f5. So now, Karpov wants to threaten me and then play bishop e6 check. Uh, yeah, this isn't so fun for black. Always repeat. And then g3. And this is my favorite part of the game when Karpov tucks his king away. He plays g3, taking away squares from the dark squared bishop. Bishop can't go here or here. Then he kicks the bishop out. Very mean. h4. That wasn't very nice. And what's the one white piece that hasn't been checkmating black yet? You. The rook, the rook on f1. Where would you like your rook? E6? Eh. I like what Karpov did better, but you're good. Where else would you like your rook? Put that white rook anywhere you want. H8. H8. That's would require a bug house game, I think. <laughs> I don't think the rook can get to H8. OK, Karpov decided F3 was a good square. Why? Well, it's a good square. But also, it stops black from queening his isolated pawn. If the rook is on the third rank, black doesn't have any counterplay. So rook d1, 
rook d3, rook f3. Now white has all his pieces attacking. I don't think black's isolated pawn is very helpful. What is helpful is white has more pawns around his king. And all the pawns are on dark squares for both sides, on the king's side. So that means this bishop can't go anywhere, and white's bishop can go everywhere. And, and the rule of thumb is you want your own pawns on the opposite color of your bishop and the same color of your opponents. So that way your bishop can move around and your opponents can't. So victory for Karpov here. King e7, very suspicious. Queen h8. Here comes the passed pawn, but Karpov already stopped it. Queen c8, surrounding the king. Rook e3 check would be risky, but rook e4 check is not. Rook e4 check. Queen c4 check. Bishop h7. What's the threat? Why are you laughing? They don't know. Queen g8 mate with advantage. Not only is this pawn isolated, it stops the black bishop from defending, blocking his own bishop. Terrible. What did black do in this position? How did he stop mate? It's Kasparov. He defends pretty well. Yes, he didn't resign. You were thinking resign. Terrible. Man, queen f7, queen c8, that's not defending so well. Rook f7, that's defending better. No. Queen e6, threatening queen e8 mate. Anyone? Queen d7, now you're defending better. Yeah. How many more moves did it take Karpov to win this game? 70 more? No. Oh. Hmm? Oh, it's yeah, get pretty close to the end. No, I was just kidding when I said he won. Traded queens and they agreed to a draw. <laughs> no. No, traded queens and black played d3, d2, and white resigned. <clears throat> Also, also not good. <laughs> queen e5, threatening queen b8 check with advantage. Yeah, and we see that white's king was safe, black's d pawn did nothing. And when Karpov wanted to play rook e3 and d4 was played, he was played rook e4. He got his rook active, his queen and bishop, and black's d pawn never was, there was no danger for white that it was queening because he blocked it. And by trading pieces and getting opposite colored bishops, unlike some other grandmasters give you the wrong information, they don't work here, uh, opposite colored bishops, when there's heavy pieces on the board, means your chances of evading attack are more successful. If the queens are off the board, it's almost certainly a draw because it's hard to win. With queens on the board, whoever has the initiative, whoever's attacking the king, they're more likely to be successful with opposite bishops. This bishop has a tough time stopping that bishop. Very tough. And who has the initiative? Thanks for asking. Usually the person who has more pawns around their king has a safer king. So white's king is very safe with the three pawns Black is much less safe with two. <clears throat> this pawn wasn't helpful at all. It didn't queen, it didn't threaten the queen, and it didn't defend black's king. And when you look at games like this, it's surprising that Kasparov is considered the greatest player ever. It seems like white should be the greatest player ever. White really positionally understood the game and just totally dominated. Although if I showed you games Kasparov be Karpov, you would think the opposite. But Karpov was really good and still is as strategical chess and getting really small advantages. And he did things really great this game, like g3, king g2, and h4, making his king perfectly safe, avoiding back rank checks, avoiding tactics on f2, and taking all these squares away from the black bishop. 
So he ended up here blocked by all his pawns. Terrible. And that's, well, I think one of Karpov's greatest victories against Kasparov because normally when you're playing a tactician, they're always getting counterplay somehow that you overlooked. You know what I'm saying? But somehow Karpov sees the counterplay, snuffs it all out, and then Black looks, looks bad. I think he resigned here. If you don't want to resign, you can try to make a move for Black. Good luck. Mm -hmm.